Hey, thanks for joining us online today. Looking forward to continuing in Luke's Gospel. We're going to look at chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. And it's the passage that's commonly called Jesus' triumphal entry. Um, before we jump in, I, I just, I don't know about you. I'm not sure where you're at, what you're going through, the challenges you might be facing. But, you know, sometimes walking with Jesus is just hard. And sometimes you feel so unworthy and so defeated. And you just wish he would come already. And uh, I know what that's like. And um, it's in those times where a message like this hopefully brings hope and encouragement and hopefully you will sort of turn the page and and just get excited about falling deeper in love with Jesus. I've titled this message, Enter the Love. And, um, you know, Jesus' entry and our entry into the love of God. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, so let's pray and then we'll just dive right in. God, thank you for your love. And thank you for demonstrating your love in ways that are beyond our comprehension. And we are so grateful, Lord, that we can enter your presence now, sit at your feet, read your word, hear your heart, know your will. And so, God, I pray that you would speak to us and that you would meet us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, after Jesus spent time with Zacchaeus in his home, and then told a parable of faithful servitude and hateful citizens, speaking of the, the national rejection of the Messiah, that is, Israel rejecting Jesus, and also true followers who invest in God and in the things of God. After saying all these things, after spending time with Zacchaeus, when he had said these things, verse 28, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. He went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now, Luke has been tracking Jesus' ascent to Jerusalem for some time, alluding to the great climax of his life and ministry, that is the cross of Christ and humanity's redemption. But notice what it says here. He went on ahead. Jesus, our triumphant king, led his followers. He went ahead of them as a good shepherd does with his sheep. A good shepherd gives his life for his sheep, Jesus said in John 10. And here he is leading by example. He's going before them. Now, Jerusalem was at the heart of, of Jewish worship and religion, the seat of their heritage and national pride. But underneath it all was corruption at the core. It was a sinful Las Vegas, you might say, concealed by religion. And when Jesus rode into the city, Though he was adored and celebrated by many, he entered the lion's den just like Daniel did in Daniel chapter 6. And, and, and Jesus did so to surrender to sinful men that he might save them. Wow! To surrender to sinful men that he might save them. He went on ahead to Jerusalem. The good shepherd was giving his life for his sheep and setting an example for all who would be appointed to lead God's people. This is confronting to me as a pastor and to those who are church leaders and fellow pastors. He's setting an example for us to follow. And not just us, but everyone, really. Now, it's less than a week before Passover, the day Jesus would die for our sins. It's Sunday. As I said, it's the triumphal entry of Christ, also known as Palm Sunday. And on this day, God lit the path to our Savior and by extension to our salvation. See, hundreds of years before this day, God spoke about it in detail. So people would have an anchor point marked in history, prophecies written down to prepare the world for the Messiah's arrival. In verses 29 to 35, we see how God was preparing people or how he prepared people for this day. 
And then we read of what happened when Jesus first came into Jerusalem there in verses 36 to 44. How did God prepare the world? Look at verse 29. When he, Jesus, drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. And so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt, and and they set Jesus on it. So they're on the Mount of Olives. And Luke notes Bethpage and Bethany, both villages on the Mount of Olives. And there Jesus told two of his disciples to go into the village, collect a colt, and to bring it back. And he gave them instructions for what to do should anyone question what they're doing. But notice the password they were to use if anyone asked what they were doing. If anyone saw them taking the colt, this is what they were to say. The Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. And that password worked. The Lord, now the word is kurios. It means supreme authority, master, speaks of God Almighty. It's a title to describe God Almighty. But God Almighty needs it, needs this young donkey, the fowl of a donkey. Why would Jesus need a young donkey? Why? Uh, He could have just walked in. Why did he need this animal? Because he needed to fulfill the scriptures. God had a plan and he foretold it to Zechariah and Jesus needed to carry out that plan. See, 550 years earlier, Zechariah prophesied that Jesus would enter Jerusalem on a colt. It says in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now, usually kings rode horses as a symbol of their military might. Occasionally they rode donkeys to indicate peace, but it was mostly priests and merchants who rode donkeys because they were men of peace and they wanted people to know that they were uh, you know, peaceful and intent. But had Jesus ridden a horse, people would have assumed the wrong message. The conquering king is here. It's time to fight. The kingdom has now come. And so he rode a donkey to signify peace. And Zechariah saw Jesus as the prince of peace riding into Jerusalem. Though Jesus came to bring peace, uh, it would require conquering. He would need to conquer sin and death in order to offer peace. That is, he came to conquer a greater enemy than Rome. He came to conquer sin. That's why this was Jesus' triumphal entry. At his triumphal entry, if you notice, it was just as humble as his birth. The king was born in a barn and laid in a food trough. And the king's coronation, as it were, he's riding on the back of a young donkey alone. Hardly a magnificent, glorious, spectacular scene. It was a very humble scene. Now, the Romans would have heard Jesus referred to as a king when he was entering the city. The king has come, they might have heard. But when they observed his victory parade, seeing him on a donkey, riding alone on the back of a young fowl, Uh, people laying their clothes out in front of him and waving palm branches. Well, the Romans must have been laughing because to them it it was really comical because a Roman triumphal entry was really spectacular. When a Roman general returned from a victory, he was welcomed with a great celebration, like Jesus was, but very different. When they returned home, it was in a golden chariot driven by horse. His plunder and enemy prisoners were exhibited behind him, and the priests burned incenses in his honor, and all the people shouted his name, praising him 
for the victory. The processional ended in the arena where the crowd was entertained by prisoners being ripped apart by wild animals. That was a, tr a Roman triumphal entry. Quite different from Jesus. Jesus rode a colt, just as God said he would, not with captives or spoils of war, but by himself, with people paying homage by laying out their clothes and waving palm branches. And all of this was a part of God's plan, part of the setup to introduce the one who would conquer sin and death, revealing the Son of God. This is how the Son of God, the King to come, would be revealed. That's how he was revealed. But notice Luke's subtle remark about the cult in verse 30. I think this is interesting, and you can easily read over this. It says, no one had ever sat on it. The point is, it was wild and unbroken. No one had sat on this little animal. But when Jesus sat on it, it wasn't a bucking bronco. It didn't kick him off. It was submissive. It was a submitted young beast, indicating Jesus' sovereignty over his creatures, pointing to his deity. Now, in addition to Zechariah, Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 25 uh, excuse me, 25 and 26, revealed the day and reason Jesus would enter Jerusalem. It would be 173,880 days from the day King Artaxerxes of Persia commanded Jerusalem to be rebuilt, Nehemiah chapter 2. That's the day, and that prophecy was fulfilled on this day when Jesus rode in. But then Daniel goes on to give us the reason in verse 26 to be cut off, but not for himself, but for us. And that term cut off indicates the death that he would die. And so when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt on the appointed day and then was cut off less than a week later, had the people connected the dots, they would have known Jesus was their Messiah. This was always God's plan which was laid out for everyone to see. Everyone could have known what God's plan was, but no one was paying attention. And so now we come to Jesus' entry, verse 36. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, when welcoming a king, it was normal for people to spread their clothes before him while waving palm branches. We see this in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses... Um, Verse 13, and as they did this, I mean, we have, we have Luke's account of what the people were saying. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But Matthew adds that they were reciting Psalm 118, verse 25, which reads, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means save now or save us. And the people were shouting, they were saying, Hosanna, save us now, the son of David. Now, Arnold Fruchtenbaum suggests the nation was mistakenly preparing for the Zechariah 14 prophecy, which speaks of all nations going up to Jerusalem in the future during the millennial kingdom to worship the Messiah at the Feast of Booths, which is to be an annual feast and a perpetual feast during the millennium. And so Frutenbaum suggests that they were preparing for this, and that's why they're doing what they're doing. He adds that in the second century BC, when the Maccabees led Israel to victory over the Syrian Greeks, they returned to Jerusalem, and the people celebrated by laying out their clothes and waving palm branches, just like they did in 2 Kings. They did again in the second century BC. So it was a common thing. And all this to say the people who were there celebrating Jesus' entry, they're still thinking the kingdom is coming immediately. 
So the king is there in Jerusalem. They're going up to worship. They're laying out their clothes as they've heard in times past, but they're preparing for the kingdom to come immediately, which is why they're celebrating, but they're celebrating for the wrong reasons. He wasn't preparing for his throne. He wasn't preparing to reign over the nation. He was preparing to be the Passover lamb. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the same day the Passover lamb was set aside for the annual sacrifice. But the people didn't get it. Now this helps us understand how they could celebrate on Sunday and then demand his execution on Friday. Just a few days later, when Friday came and they're observing Jesus being tortured, arrested, all the stuff that he's experiencing and they're demanding that he be crucified, how could their tune change so quickly? Well, the religious leaders were saying he's blasphemous and and they were saying all kinds of terrible lies about him and the people believed it. But when the kingdom didn't come as they were anticipating and they see the supposed king from their perspective being brutally beaten and, and losing, they're like, this guy's an imposter, crucify him. Nevertheless, this was an important date on God's calendar See, earlier in the psalm, in verse 24, verse 25 we touched on, Hosanna to the son of David. In verse 24, the verse before, the psalmist said, this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day. We often hear that verse tied to weddings. And preachers at weddings will say, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. These two people are getting married and it's glorious and great. And we think, oh, that's, that's, that's sweet. But he's talking about this day that Jesus entered Jerusalem. This is the day the Lord has made, which is incredible because on this day, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he accepted public worship from the people. This day that God has ordained, the day that the Lord has made. See, up to this point, Jesus discouraged people from worshiping him. It is not yet my hour, he said repeatedly. We see that through the Gospels. It's not yet time, it's not yet my hour. But on this day, Jesus accepted their worship because his hour had come and God ordained this day. Well, hearing all the celebration and the commotion, the religious leaders seeing this, they understood what the people were saying in verse 39 and and they told Jesus to tell the people to shut up. Tell them to shut up. They're claiming you're the Messiah. Tell them to shut up. They're worshiping you as the Messiah. Tell them to shut up. But notice what Jesus said, his reply. Are you kidding me? If they should keep quiet, even the rocks would cry out. This is the day the Lord has made. Jesus would be praised and adored by, as the Messiah, either by the people or by all of creation. But he was going to be praised and adored. It was going to happen because the Father wanted the world to know who Jesus is and what he was about to do. And so on this day, he accepted worship. He received worship as the people praised and adored, even without realizing fully who he was. Now, if you ever get a chance to go to Jerusalem, you have to go into the city and pick up a few rocks off the ground and then bring those rocks home. I don't know if that's contraband, if they'll let you or not, but let's just say hypothetically you did. And you brought them home and you set them on a little arrangement on the mantle or something like that. And people would come over to your house and they would say, hey, what's those rocks? What's that all about? And then you could tell them, these are the rocks that would have cried out if the people didn't. Now, all this was happening as Jesus was going down the Mount of Olives into the holy city. And in the midst of this celebration, in the midst of all this joy, the reality of lost souls and God's judgment hit Jesus hard. Look at verse 41. 
And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day, there it is, the reference to this particular day, would you have known that on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Why? For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Because the nation rejected him as the Messiah. And Jesus revealed that in the parable that he had just told in verses 14 and 27. But because they rejected him as the Messiah, Jesus knew judgment was coming. And in verses 43 to 44, he described the utter destruction and desolation of Jerusalem that was to come about 40 years later, which did come in 70 AD. And the Roman general Titus and his army, they laid siege against the city, just as Jesus said here, and they destroyed it. Though the nation, though, was decimated, some of the towers and bits and pieces, remnants were left for various purposes that, for whatever reason, benefited the Romans. And some sort of things were left around. But in, in 135 AD, about 65 years later, when the Roman Emperor Hadrian sought to eradicate all of Judaism, every semblance of Jew, to utterly ex cause them to go into extinction, if you will, it was then that he changed the name of Israel in the name of the region to Palestine. Keep that in mind when you think of today's current events. He changed the name of the region to Palestine. And Jesus knew all this was coming, which broke his heart. He wept over the city, it says. When he looked out and saw what would come, he wept. Now this wasn't just watery eyes and a few tears. He wailed. It was audible sobbing. He was really upset. And he said, if only you knew and understood the significance of this day, the peace that I have for you, the things that make for peace. But because you've hardened your hearts towards God and rejected me, what could have given you peace and the things that make for your peace, now these things are hidden from your eyes. Because you rejected me, you won't know them. You can't see them because you rejected me. Instead, you will have war and suffering all because you did not know the time of your visitation. You weren't discerning of the signs of the times. You didn't go to the scriptures for clarity and confirmation, and you readily bought into the lies who taught you for their own selfish gain and their own selfish reasons. You didn't know the time of your visitation. When God came to you, you didn't get it. You didn't see him. You didn't know him. Now, here's the thing. The nation Israel had all the evidence before them. The prophetic scriptures, the Messiah himself who did signs and wonders, who taught with loving authority, who demonstrated grace, who fulfilled prophecy. All they had to do was piece together, together the evidence and they would have known who Jesus was. And the same is true today. All people have to do is investigate the evidence and they will come to know who Jesus is. Now, whether they embrace him or not, well, that remains to be seen, but there can be no denying who he is, what he did, and why he did it if someone would truly investigate the evidence. That's why it's so frustrating for us who know Jesus, because to us it's so obvious. Can't they see it, we wonder? Why don't they get it? It's so clear, it's so obvious. But sadly, people are deterred by their unwillingness to believe. They don't wanna believe. Or they're deterred by the poor Christian examples of some who have hurt them or betrayed them or used them. 
by the lack of feeling or emotion. Hey, I'm not feeling anything when I hear this, when I read this, so it must not be true. Or they're deterred by a greater desire for selfish pleasure. They love their sin and they love to do it and they don't want to change. Or they're deterred by believing the lies of science or by false religion. Let me remind you, evolution is not based on facts. The Big Bang Theory is not based on facts. These aren't facts of science. Theories aren't factual. Now you could argue with me all you want, but if you actually burrow down into what's available in terms of evidence, you won't find facts. Or you might find someone who proposes something as fact, who has a media uh, or a personal bias, but it doesn't mean it's factual. That to say, people are, are deterred by believing lies from different camps, but none of these are valid excuses for rejecting Christ. God has spoken prophetically and he has fulfilled prophecy. He has proven his love by sending his one and only son and by his son dying on our behalf, by obeying the will of the Father to the very end proved his love and who he is and the claims he met, made by the fact that he rose from the dead. The resurrection is proof enough. If people would just look at the ex evidence, man, they'd be overwhelmed. And so as God did then, so he'll do again, hold people accountable and condemn those who reject him. Now, I don't say that lightly, and it's certainly not a pleasant thought. And God doesn't do this without tears. In fact, we see right here Jesus wailing because of it. It breaks his heart to deal with those who reject him, because God is not willing that any should perish. He's not willing that any should perish. Then, then why would he condemn people? if he's not willing that any would perish, because he's holy and he's just. And anything that's unholy cannot dwell in his presence. He has to deal with it. And he will. But it's not what God wants. Now, we read of th three times where Jesus cried. First of all, when Lazarus died in John chapter 11. When Lazarus died, Jesus wept with Lazarus' sisters over the suffering effects of sin. He mourned with the girls, but he was broken over the effects of sin, which was suffering and death. Later, as in after this day, but before the crucifixion, in the garden, it says in Hebrews 5, 7, when Jesus sweat, as it were, drops of blood, that, that with loud cries and tears, he, he lamented, knowing his obedience to the Father would cause the Father to turn away from him. When darkness covered the land as Jesus hung on the cross from noon to three, I believe it's as Jesus bore the sin of humanity and the Father could not look upon the Son. And God symbolically showed the world the darkness of sin that his son had borne. But when Jesus cried in the garden, he was lamenting at the thought of broken fellowship with God. And then here, the third time, at the sight of God's beloved city in rebellion against him, he wailed over lost souls who refused to embrace him. Jesus never cried for himself. Even after he was betrayed and faced an illegal trial by his countrymen, after being abandoned by his disciples and flogged by the Romans, all these things that happened to him unjustly, he didn't cry for himself, oh man, this is so hard, this is such a miserable thing, I'm, I'm, I, I feel bad, you know, you know, he didn't. And as he carried his cross toward Golgotha, he said to the crying women who were following him, 
He said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but for yourselves and for your children. Luke 23, 28. Don't weep for me. Don't lament me, but weep for yourselves because he knew what was to come and what they would experience. The point is, Jesus is far more concerned with you than he is for himself because that's what love is, that's what love does. That's why Peter exhorted us in 1 Peter 5, 7 to cast all our cares and anxieties on him because he cares for you. He truly does. Cast all your cares and anxieties on him because he cares for you. If we really know how much God loves us and cares for us, our lives would be revolutionized. If we really knew and lived in light of his tremendous love, what security, what satisfaction, what hope, what joy. Listen to what Paul said to the Romans when he wrote to the Christians in Rome. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Can anyone? Can anything? He goes on, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, can any of those things separate us from the love of Christ? And he says in verse 37, Romans chapter 8, no. In all these things, in fact, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Even the, the, the worst things you could ever do can separate you from the love of God. But he does require us to surrender before him, seeking forgiveness, confessing our sin, and repenting of our ways, that he might wash over us, cleanse us, renew us, and restore us. But he does that because he loves us. And he requires that because he loves us. Because he doesn't want anything to break our fellowship with him. And he doesn't want anything to tear us away from him. Now even though something tears us away from him, it doesn't mean God stops loving. He still loves. And he will reach out. He will hound us. He will pursue us. Because that's the love of our, of our God. He loves you so much. What keeps you from loving him? Is there anything preventing you or distracting you from loving him? Surrender that. Enter his love. Enjoy his presence. Receive his grace. And walk in his blessings. Let's pray. God, thank you for the love you've shown and demonstrated, the love you have relentlessly proven and continue to show to us daily. Help us, Lord, to enter your love, to sit there, enjoy it, to walk in it, and rejoice because of it. I pray that you'd be our strength. Help us, Lord, to really uh, help us, God. Just help us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, or you need to talk to somebody, give us a call, drop us a note, send an email. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.